Welcome everyone. My name is Karen Zagans and I'm the director and flute faculty for Z-Tunes Music. I'm excited to welcome the ASO oboist Emily Braybach as our clinician today. Ms. Braybach has been playing English horn and oboe with the ASO since 2012. She's performed with several orchestras throughout the United States, including the Boston Symphony, Houston Symphony, Kansas City Symphony, the Minnesota Orchestra, the Sarasota Orchestra, and the Sarasota Opera. Ms. Braybach is an artist affiliate instructor of oboe at Emory University, a faculty member of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra's talent development program, and also maintains an active private studio out of her home. For today's clinic, we're all going to stay on mute while she works through the GMEA oboe audition excerpts. You can type any questions you might like to ask in the chat box, and we'll ask them at the end of each excerpt. So over to you, Ms. Emily. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's watching. I'm excited to get into these uh, really kind of interesting um, Allstate etudes that we have today. Uh, so I'm gonna start by just playing through the first one. Uh, this is uh, called Waltz. things about this one. First of all, it's marked waltz, eighth note equals 144. So 144 on my metronome sounds like this, right, which is pretty active. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not thinking about it quite so vertically, like da, 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 right, because then it can get re really heavy and really um, and not have enough flow. So what I would recommend is instead of putting your uh, your metronome on eighth note equals 144, I'd encourage you to put your eighth note on the dotted quarter note, which when we're in six, eight, right? You can either count it one, two, three, four, five, six, or one and uh, two. And uh, so uh, I would recommend instead doing the second version and putting the metronome on dotted quarter note equals 48. So that sounds a lot nicer. It's all the way down here. Two, three, four, five, six, one, and uh, two, and uh, so it's a lot calmer, right? It gives us a little bit more sense of that back and forth feeling, uh, not so much just like every beat going like this. So that's the first thing I would recommend. Um, second thing is we have a really kind of interesting rhythm at the end of the first bar. Right, so we have, usually we don't see that rhythm in the second half of the bar. Right, so that's that's a kind of uncommon rhythm. So make sure that if you are having trouble with that rhythm to either refer back to this recording of it or put your, your metronome on the eighth notes just to figure out where the beats are, right? So if we're counting in eighth notes, the E is on beat four, uh, the D is on beat five, and the B is on the and of six. And then uh, we go through to the next uh, D da 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 da. Just make sure you're moving forward through that beat into the next beat. Um, the next kind of thorny thing we have is uh, the grace notes in measure 14, 13, 12, 11, 11 and 12, right? So make sure that you're playing those grace notes before the beat, that you're not letting it, um, the grace notes mess up your rhythm, right? So starting in measure, what is that, 11? Right, so da 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 is how I'm thinking about it. So they take up time from the note before, and if you're having trouble getting those lined up on time, take start by taking the brace notes out. Right, 
Um, so the next thing to do, if you're having trouble with those grace notes, once you've taken them out and you understand where the big, the big notes are, um, just put your, me your metronome on, like I said, 48 or 144 to the eighth note, whichever one you're, you're doing. So, and just try and land on beat two of that bar. Just make sure you're landing on time. Right, and just stop there and make sure that you're lining that up and then move on from there. And don't forget that just because the grace notes are fast, that doesn't mean that the eighth notes are any faster. So you have to be fast on the grace notes and then nice and slow and smooth on the eighth notes. And then hold that nice forte E and then take a breath and move on. I think you don't, once you finish the E, I don't think that you need to count the eighth rest in a perfect eighth rest um, from the previous tempo. Just take a, take a break for a second and then move on. I think that's perfectly fine to do. Um, and the next sort of um, mechanical issue we might have is at the end. So these, uh, a, lot, a lot of times, as if you're an 11th or 12th grader, you've been doing these all state auditions for a long time. So you know that they tend to have a nice big Richardondo at the end, right? Richardondo means to slow down, obviously. Um, so just make sure that it's, a, it's a, actually, it's a slow wing down, right? It's not an automatic, quick, slow temp, like all of a sudden a slow tempo, right? So it's not, Right, that's, that's kind of like coming to a halt all of a sudden. It's like if you were driving and someone hit on the brakes, right? It doesn't quite make a lot of sense. So just remember that the, the goal is to slow down by the time you get to the E. So dial that tempo down uh, gradually instead of slamming on the brakes. Is a perfectly fine way to do that, Richard Ondo. It doesn't need to slow down into, into nothingness. So just end it, end it nicely. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about style. So a waltz is a dance, right? It's a dance that's in three. So oftentimes we'll see a waltz in three, four or in three, eight. Um, six, eight is, is in that same realm of the subdivision of three of the beat. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one. We have that sort of feeling. Um, or in this case, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, which is again why I recommend um, practicing this on the dotted quarter equals 48 instead of the instead of the eighth note equals 144. Um, so just think about the 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 kind of the the style of a waltz is that beat three always goes to beat one. So in this case, when we're thinking about six eight, we want the third eighth note of every big beat leads in to the um, the downbeat of the next beat. So we always have this forward motion one two three one two three one three one is always what what we're going to be feeling. Um, right, so make sure that you're not stopping the slurs, de, uh, de, right, and make sure you're not over accenting the, each of the downbeats. So give it this nice lyrical, beautiful legato feel while still propelling it forward, right, in this, in this nice, graceful, waltz-like fashion. Um, I'd also encourage you to really use this as an opportunity to work on your tone quality. Right. Um, if, this, if you're finding that this piece is really easy for you and you've kind of learned it super quick, use it as an excuse to really focus on playing with a beautiful sound, with a beautiful vibrato, um, you know, with a nice roundness to your fortes, um, a nice uh, uh, color and core to your pianos um, so that uh, you're really trying to expand your um, your color palette as a musician. Um, so again, we have all this beautiful legato music. Right, so crescendo through that D, I vibrate really beautifully. And then breathe, and then the next note is, is louder than where you just left off by a little bit, right? So that you're thinking about this, this crescendo going on even when, you're, when, you're, um, when there's a rest. Right, and make sure that those uh, 16th notes in measure three don't sound too uh, beady, right? Da, 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 da. Don't, don't sound too active.
perspective, right? So dee da 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 dee da da. My teacher in high school always used to say that even if you're playing a slow piece of music and you have fast notes, those fast notes still need to sound like they are part of a slow piece of music. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> focusing on the legato, focusing on not um, not rushing through them, really, you know, drawing them out to their full um, full value, not not uh, allowing them to kind of move forward because they're faster. Um, and again, I sound like a broken record, but it's going to make your life a lot easier if you have this on dotted quarter note as opposed to the eighth note, because the eighth note is just going to da da dee da 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 da, and kind of bang it into your head. Um, we have this nice, beautiful upward slur in measure five. Right, that D to B slur is really beautiful, so make sure that it's a nice, clean legato, that you're not doing anything with your embouchure to bite between the two notes. Yeah. Think about an ah sound as you go up. Another thing my teacher from high school used to say, he was a very smart man, is that if you're going from a lower note to a higher note, you have to have the energy in the lower note to allow the, the upper note to come out. Just as if you were thinking about if you were jumping, right? You, you know, you get, you are on the ground and you push off with all your energy from the ground, right? The ground is what gives you the energy to get high up in the air. You can't do anything once you're up in the air. That's just how physics works. Um, so same thing, our dee da ya da da and we're, we're you know, I, I would encourage you to think of a little bit of a crescendo, so to foreshadow the crescendo that comes in the next measure. Um, just to kind of help you get through that really beautiful upward slur. Um, and then we have in measure eight, nice um, piano. We have a crescendo poco a poco, which of course means get louder little by little. So <laughs> one thing that I often see students do is they see a crescendo and they automatically get loud, right? So you have to pace that crescendo. The point of the crescendo is the forte all the way at the end of that line, right? Where the, where the fermata is. So don't, don't give it away too soon. I would even say that the C measure Eight and nine are piano, 10 would be mezzo piano, 11 would be mezzo forte, and then you get to forte in, the, in that final measure. So really pace out that crescendo so you're not giving away too much too early and then just sort of playing forte for the last bar or two. that E should be the loudest, not until you get there. Um, and while I'm thinking about it, if you're playing on a Lorray oboe, E's, that octave E, we all know it tends to be pretty sharp. So you'll, you've probably seen me putting down my B key every time I have an E natural, an octave E natural, not, not the lower octave, but the one at the top of the staff. Um, that's one thing you can do to help bring that pitch down. If, if your E is even sharper than mine, you can use your low B flat key as well, right? So either one of these kind of play around with them and see what works on your instrument. But it's important that this E, which is a really crucial note in this um, in this etude, isn't too sharp, and it's going to tend, it's going to want to be, um, if, especially if you play a Lorray. So make sure that you're thinking about that, and that's one one little trick that you can do to help help those notes out, especially on that fermata, right? You don't want to hold an E that's 20 cents sharp um, when you have these options um, for you to use. Um, we also have measure seven, eight, nine, ten. In measure ten, we have the tenudos over the eighth notes at the end of the bar. That just means to give it some love, right? I wouldn't worry too much about, um, uh, obviously don't stretch the note so that you stretch the, the time, right? That's not what a tenudo is supposed to be. It's just supposed to be the longest amount of time that you can spend on the note in the given time. So I would think about a light tongue and vibrato and sustaining through that note <coughs> to give yourself um, uh, uh, one, the tone color and the quality of a tenudo. So. Right, so we have the vibrato is a, is a great tool. I'm a big fan of using vibrato um, to get around all sorts of things. Vibrato is a great tool to, to use in general. It's not just to um, improve your sound, although it does that, of course, but it also can um, help to bring out notes in certain ways. You can use vibratos for accents, which we will use in the next etude. There's a lot of accents in this guy. Um, <coughs> And so then also, here we are at the end of the etude, we start mezzo piano, and then we have what looks like a big crescendo in forte, but it only goes to mezzo forte. So don't give it away too soon. Again, you don't wanna peak, you don't wanna have that nice big forte until it's marked two bars before the end. Um, and then a nice beautiful diminuendo controlled on that diminuendo so you don't go sharp on your D. <clears throat> Make sure that you're not overdoing it by biting, right? So get the control from the corners of your embouchure as much as you can as you close down the aperture and also reduce your airstreams, but make sure that you're not 
just doing it with your with your jaw muscles. Um, do we have any questions? Are there any questions about this etude? I will play it one more time for you. Um, all right, I am not seeing any questions, but I'll play it one more time. And if anything comes up, um, you just type it in the chat and I will answer it for you. Also see in there there are a couple places where I breathed out and breathe in Ooh, I always get so winded <laughs> when I play um, <laughs> so breathing out and in quickly is a good skill that you have to be able to develop as an oboe player and because we only have these little eighth rests through this this etude sometimes you're gonna have to do that so uh, plan that in practice that in um, think about it in your daily practice in general breathing out and breathing in really quickly being able to do that um, so if we don't have, oh, here we go. How much freedom do we have to play around with the tempo? Um, I think because it's a waltz, um, they've given us some clue as to the fact that it's, it should be um, pretty predictable, right? So if I think if, if something's in a dance form, you know, waltz, minuet, um, you know, any of those that we commonly see in classical music, I would keep it pretty steady. Um, uh, you don't want to play in a way that's going to make someone you know fall over <laughs> if you if they were to be dancing to what you're playing um there's a little bit of space of course right so i would say if you wanted to be a little fancy um around the um around the fermata is where you have some room but i wouldn't start super slow say in measure um uh, measure eight that pickup i wouldn't start super slow and then speed up to the fermata you know it just there are some things that if it wasn't marked waltz i might have a different opinion but because it is a dance form um, i do think that we have to have just a little bit more um steadiness that being said if you do want to play around with rubato a little bit in the within the beats right so we're always finding one and uh two so that's always nice and steady um as long as we're getting to those beats on time, you have some wiggle room within the beat. So you may have heard that I did a little bit of a, um, uh, a little bit of a fancy footwork in the in the third measure. So. Uh. Right, so I held that first G just a little bit, and that's a trick that my teacher in high school used to um, used to recommend that you know you have to help the listener get from the slower notes into the faster notes. So if you did. It's just a little, um, it's a little abrupt, right? So you do have some freedoms in there for sure, but I think just in terms of having a steady, you know, tempo, that's that's what I would go for um, with this one. I hope that answers your question, but it's a good, it is a good question. Um, a lot of times these Allstate etudes are um, are pretty prescri prescriptive, right? They say exactly what they want you to do, um, and I think it's it's not only um, important but possible and musically feasible to make all of this sound musical within a fairly um, uh, prescriptive uh, context. So um, sometimes the restrictions are what make the art more interesting. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions with the first etude, I will go on to Vivace. Um, and if you think of any questions um, about the first one or about the second one, you can you can type them in the chat and I'll, I'll answer them for sure. Okay, so here we go. Vivace. Oh, water already. Oh my goodness. I'm not going to get through this if there's water in my... Okay. <laughs> Let's take two.
one is speedy, <laughs> right? Vivace means lively. Quarter note equals 168 is very fast. Um, so I think I would recommend the same um, metronome work that I recommended in the first one. Well, first of all, if you have to start this slow, oh, it's always better to start slow, right? Start slow when you're practicing, start at a metronome uh, marking that's, that's possible for you to achieve so you can learn it and then slowly move the metronome up. But when you're at the point past learning all the notes, um, I would encourage you to put the metronome on the half note instead of the quarter note. So in this case, it would be, what's that, 84. Um, so that you're da 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 Again, it gives it a little bit less of a da 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 which is kind of um, like a machine gun, <laughs> right? It's right in your face. It's all right. It's both thinking about it in half bars. Yeah, da 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 It gives more fluidity. Um, that's a trick that I use a lot. My teacher in grad school um, used to do that. He sometimes would put the metronome on one beat every four bars. He had this crazy metronome that he could have it beat, you know, like two beats per minute or something. Um, but that's a really great trick to help you um, carry the line through, to have your air moving in the right direction, all that good stuff. So this um, this etude goes back and forth between this really um, uh, legato, uh, smooth, and then we have this like the eighth notes, right? Um, so make sure you're, you're uh, making a, a good difference between that. And I think not only in making the staccato short, but also in making the legato really, really beautiful. Still, water, every day. Even the pros get it, folks. Right, so you can hear in there, I'm not going. Right, I'm not saying da 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 da, I'm saying da 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 I'm moving, moving through the, um, through the slurs with my air, right? So the air stream is just like I'm playing one long C. Is what my air is doing, essentially. So just keeping the air moving, keeping your fingers moving nice and close to the keys, um, and moving all the way through that so that it's, it's really nice and, and smooth. And then you get to this nice spiky. So you hear what I'm doing there. I'm using vibrato as, as part of my toolkit for the accents. I mentioned this earlier. Um, so for an, an accented note, when you're already in forte, you can use more air and more tongue. Um, but again, that ends up being sounding pretty uh, heavy. Um, so I want to use some more air and some more tongue, but also a faster vibrato right at the beginning of the note to kind of put like a neon sign that this is this is the important stuff. Da da di, right? That's what I'm what I'm thinking. So it's not da da da, really, you know, aggressive or percussive. Um, we do need that sometimes for sure, but I think that there's um, there's a lot to be said for using vibrato as a as an expressive tool, and this is this is a perfect example of this. Um, so we have all sorts of different fingerings you can use for your Fs, right? So I, um, I personally am a fan of fork def. I like fork def. I don't think it's I don't think it's as evil as some people <laughs> some some people seem to think it is, especially when a moving passion path moving passage. I wouldn't use it on a long F that's held out because it's not super pretty, but. <laughs> That's what I'm doing for that, just because it's just one finger, right? I don't have to try and coordinate two two different hands together. Um, so that's what I'm using for for there. But left F would work perfectly fine as well if you're more com uh, comfortable with fork F. Than, or sorry, with left F. Um, and uh, the important thing is just whatever is cleanest for you, right? That's that's all you really need to worry about. If fork F is not clean, then use left F. If left F is not clean, use fork F. It's totally fine. Um, and then we have the same sort of um, basic idea for throughout the rest of uh, this opening section. Oh, and here's, here's why I do a fancy thing here. So I switch from regular F to, to, fork, or to left F in the middle, right? So as you can see, your left F, I don't know if you can see it on this video, pushes down this key, pushes down this key for you, just does it with this finger. So you can play regular F, hold down the left F key and pick this guy up and just switch in the middle um, so you can get to a regular E flat or uh, yeah because that's really kind of kind of your only option because we're holding an, a fork F and like I said fork F for a long note not my favorite uh, or you could just go straight to left F I suppose there but there is that option there's always that option I don't know if any of you know the um, oboe solo from the second movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony it is a master class in switching around your F's and your E flats um, just so you don't end up on a fork def on a, on a long note um, 
So, okay, here we go. And then we're going, same thing starting after the double line or double bar. Right, and we have dim ba. So make sure that A flat uh, has enough buoyancy to get you into the next downbeat. Right, and then a, a measure fifteen. The articulation gets a little bit a little bit trickier. Right, and then we go into a, a next section. Now here's the tricky part. That water just does not want to get out of my sea key. The, the next part, pick up into 21, is an eighth note. It's not a quarter note. So this is a place where you might want to circle or, or put some eyeglasses or something so you don't just do the same pattern that's happened before. Right, and again, using that vibrato for those accents so they don't end up sounding too aggressive. This also does remind me of another one of the big um, uh, technical challenges in this piece, which is going back and forth between triplet subdivisions of the beat and eighth note subdivisions of the beat, right? So make sure that you're not you're not rushing your uh, eighth notes, right? Da 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 da. It's very easy if you're not practicing with the metronome to go da 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 because it's it's always kind of surprising. It feels like you know you're changing gear really quickly to go from the da 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 one two three one two three one and two and one two three one two three one and two and really so make sure you you have that ability. Make up some rhythm exercises for yourself, right? Go back and do a whole measure of triplet beats and then a whole measure of eighth note beats and then go get get to the point where you're doing one beat of triplets, one beat of eighth notes. You can make up all sorts of rhythmic, rhythmic exercises. Um, even if you're walking around, you know, our, our feet tend to stay the same um, the same tempo when we're walking, just generally speaking. So just as you're walking, just think and see if you can really keep yourself nice and honest. There's all sorts of ways that you can practice this uh, in front of the instrument and also away from the instrument. Um, but your metronome is going to be your friend if this is something that's tricky for you. Um, this is one time when I would say putting it on the quarter note would be good just to keep you honest. Da 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 right? Um, and once that becomes uh, clear to you, once you're really well um, versed in how to go back and forth, then put it on the half note on that uh, 84, I believe. Um, do we have any questions about this one before I play it through one more time? It's a really, it's a really um, gnarly little one. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty tricky, so really do spend some time with your metronome at a slow tempo first before you start um, speeding it up. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I am going to play it through one more time. I see one more question in the chat. Do the double bars mean we get to take a pause at those points? Unfortunately not. So these double bars are just giving us an idea of where the piece is sectioned off, right? So just so you can mentally say, this chunk belongs together, this chunk belongs together, this chunk belongs together. Um, if it was a, a double bar, uh, like uh, with darker ink, with thicker lines, um, then it might imply that. Um, but only if, if again, it was another line and maybe like a different tempo marking or something. But unfortunately, those are just for your visual ability to chunk the pieces together. So you got to just kind of like barrel through on this one. There's no stopping at those double bars, those tiny little, um, very thin double bars. Um, do we have any more questions? Any questions about anything oboe related at all? Anything I said that didn't make any sense? I do see one person who says, yay, pro forked F. Absolutely. I'm in the forked F club. <laughs> 
it gets unfairly maligned. Um, okay, well, I think if there aren't any more questions, then we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you everyone for Alrighty. watching. Thank you, Ms. Graybach, for all of your insight. I know I learned a lot today. And um, Ooh, I see, oh, I see one more question. Go, go, go. I see one more question. Do you have any advice to get good recordings? Yes, uh, <laughs> so much. First of all, backup, right? So you don't want the oboe, you don't want to be recording with your bell right at the um, the the microphone, right? You want to back up so that if you're um, recording, I don't, I'm not sure if GMA is asking for video or just audio recordings. Um, you don't know either. Okay. Um, yet. <laughs> so what I would do is it, the kind of the, the mental picture that you should have is like, if you have your phone up and you're taking a video, you should be able to see the entire instrument, right? So it should be far enough back so you can see the entire instrument just so that you have a little bit of distance. Um, the second thing I'd recommend is not starting the day that it's due. <laughs> which I know, I know so many people are going to do. And trust me, I've been in that boat. I've had, you know, uh, when I was in college and auditioning for summer festivals, there were so many days that I finished the recording on the day that I needed or started the recording on the day that I needed to mail it, um, back when, back before you emailed these recordings in. Um, but I would really encourage you to get used to, um, recordings. There's something really weird about turning on a, a microphone in front of you. You go from like, it's fine. I'm playing this. This is no big deal. You turn on a microphone. All of a sudden everything looks weird. It's like how, what's going to, it's really disconcerting. It's a really disconcerting feeling. Um, so getting used to that and starting to record much earlier, a week before, if you can, more, if you're feeling really confident, um, just to get used to what um, uh, what it feels like to be recorded. And also it's really good to just listen to recordings of yourself, right? So if you have these reference recordings, um, you think you have everything set, it's a week before the audition, you, you record yourself, um, and then you listen back, you're like, oh my goodness, I am really rushing that one part. Um, there's something about just stepping back and hearing a recording of yourself that you're going to hear stuff that you didn't hear before. It's a really, really great practice tool in general, even if you're not um, uh, practicing for a, for a recorded audition. And just recording yourself in your practicing is a really great thing to do to keep yourself honest. Um, so those are the two big ones. If you have an external microphone, you know, there are people who know lots of things more than I do about external microphones and what devices to use. And then there's a billion and a half videos on YouTube to tell you about all that. What I can tell you just in terms of preparation, back up. <laughs> the oboe is not at its, at its finest coming straight out of the end of the bell. Um, and start recording early so that you um, make sure that you're, you're giving yourself the best chance to um, to get used to the the weirdness of recording those are the two biggest tips that i'd recommend and also um you know send if you are starting to make recordings and you think you, you know you want an opinion send it to someone you trust maybe your teacher will be nice enough to listen to your recordings before you send them in i think most teachers would if they have the time would be more than happy to do that send it to a friend you trust um you know say you know should i send this in do i need to do it again um you know, it's really good to get an extra set of ears on yourself as well. So I think those are those are three big things you can do to ensure that you get a good recording. And like I said, in terms of like equipment, I'm not the right person to ask. You just look it up on YouTube. Some, someone smarter than me knows how to do that. So any other questions? These are great questions. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Braybach, for today. Um, and good luck to everyone who's taking these auditions. I know this is quite the year and things are going to be done a little bit differently. So good luck. Look out for more communications from Z-Tunes Music on lessons and some upcoming clinics for Allstate and more. And everyone have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.